Hey everybody, welcome to this week's Q&A. Uh, it looks like there's only questions on one platform this week, which is totally cool. I just want to remind everybody that it doesn't matter what platform you support on, I will answer any question that is posted in any of the latest Q&A posts on each platform. So I, I wish there was an easier way to go through and, and organize all of this stuff, but I think the simplest thing for everybody is just ask your question wherever you support on the newest support post, and if for whatever reason I don't answer the question. It's almost always because I either deleted it in post while I was trying to get everything together, or sometimes I, I think I might have just skipped them by accident. So it's never intentional. Please just re-ask or, or message me directly if it's really important or anything. But anyway, let's jump in and start answering questions. Mark Main wants to know, will the new Dreamcast component cables from HD Retrovision support light gun games? And the answer is yes. Um, the last time I had one of the prototype sets here, it worked in both 480i and 480p mode. Um, I tested both on a consumer grade TV with uh, component video inputs, as well as on my one of my Sony BVMs that's 480p compatible, and both worked perfectly. So I would assume that anything that works with the original RGB or VGA output would work identically with the HD retro HD retrovision cables, uh, just like with all the other HD retrovision cables on the other consoles. Bradley wants to know if anybody has created or maintained a list of companies that make good quality and properly designed cartridges for new retro games. I'm not sure, um, and I think a better thing to do might be. Um, might be to have a list of each individual game and, if possible, production run. So, like, let's take Tanglewood, for example. You know, the original release had X amount of carts. Those were all checked out to be pretty much perfect. Um, I, I really like that, too. Like the quality of it, you know, the even everything, the insert, the manual, it was cool. Um, and then there was just a re-release of it. And I don't know if anybody has gone through and checked it yet. I don't know if anybody's opened up and done a side-by-side -side comparison, but that's something I think would be pretty beneficial. Whereas it's kind of hard to say this company always makes good or this company always makes bad, even though there are definitely companies that have only put out garbage. But, um, you know, it's one of these things where if you're a reputable company and you've been going through a reputable manufacturer and you have 10 games out and you go to do game number 11, there's no telling what that manufacturer is going to do. How do you know that manufacturer hasn't been bought out by somebody else that goes, all right, switch all hard gold out with brass or something, you know, they'll never know the difference. Like that stuff does definitely happen. So I think if a list were to be maintained per game and per release would probably be a better way to gauge that. And also, you know, it's my opinion that if you get a new, a new retro game, you should take it apart, snap some pictures and post it you know, wherever you socialize, whether it's social media, Discord, whatever. Because if you're a company that has taken the time to do everything right, to have a manual that's spelled correctly, to have a really nice insert, to have a cartridge that's built right and with the right components on it, you know, that's a good thing to have people showing those off. You know, if I were a company that took the time to do that and I saw a bunch of posts of people saying, hey, look at this, everything's great. You know, check out this beveled edge. It looks perfect. Like, that's a good thing. Whereas if you, you know, take apart your cartridge and it looks like crap, you know, I don't like to see that. I don't certainly don't like to, to shame anybody, companies or people, whatever. But, you know, that's info that's got to get out there. So it's my opinion that, you know, when you get these new releases, snap a picture and post it. If the company's done a good job, I'm sure they'll really appreciate the uh, word of mouth. You know, hey, look, this is good quality. And if they did a bad job, you know, what, what could I say? I mean, if you do a bad job, somebody's going to call you out on it. So <laughs> just my opinions, though. Next, a question from Dario, a.k.a. Kavach. Am I pronouncing both your actual name and your, your screen name correctly? Because I remember you taught me how to pronounce it right a few years ago, and I think I got it right then, and I just i am so sorry it slipped my mind. I never intentionally get anybody's name wrong. I'm just really bad at it, but I do try. So please, please correct me again. My, my apologies if I screwed it up. But to your actual question... Um, if you pick up a Dreamcast and add an optical drive emulator, uh, would it become truly region free? So in this scenario, it would be a DC digital with an optical drive emulator. So I read your question and I actually asked Dan and Christoph to confirm the answer because I'm not very confident in my PAL knowledge. And so this is coming right from them, assuming that I'm interpreting it correctly. Um, 
in that in the scenario of DC Digital and an optical drive emulator, it is region free in that it'll play all games, PAL, NTSC, NTSCJ, whatever. However, they'll run in their original resolution and frame rate for any 15 kilohertz content. All VGA, so all 480p stuff, runs the same. So in this scenario, if you have a PAL VA1 Dreamcast and you put in a DC Digital and you're uh, obviously that would mean you're playing on a flat panel so you're predominantly going to be want to play in 480p or above it would own everything would run identical except the few games that are 480i only that you would then be deinterlacing um if that's something that actually bugs you you could do some kind of uh region swap or bio swap but you could also just uh install a switch and change it over uh, or, and change regions that way. So Pete from M Monkey uh, did a guide on this eight years ago now, uh, and it looks like, according to this guide, I've never done it before. I did read through the guide, but once again, I could be messing it up. Um, it looks like you just need to add one wire from one resistor to one spot on the motherboard in order to switch back and forth between NTSC or PAL. And if that's true, uh, if I'm interpreting this correctly, you could install a switch somewhere. So power off the console, flick the switch, power the console back on. To be honest, I would unplug the console, not just power it off. Uh, but you should be able to switch between regions. But once again, this would only be a thing for 15 kilohertz games, 240p, 480i. So if you're running in 480p, it wouldn't really matter anyway. So, you know, if you're already going to install a DC digital, which is kind of a complicated install, and you know that you're going to be playing games from different regions, maybe talk to your modder or maybe talk to your mod shop where you're buying the DC digital from. Maybe you're going right from Dan or I don't know. I think Dan has uh, European resellers of that as well. And uh, I'm sorry, I might be wrong about that part. But, you know, just look into uh, what else people offer for that. Because uh, I know if if there's that, there's got to be a different BIOS replacement, so you could do it that way. Um, there's got to be people that have done the switch method if that works. So I would just kind of look around and see what fits. But for me personally, I always use 480p mode with the only exception of Third Strike. I run in 240p and Gunlord. And I think there's one other shooter game that I do enjoy that I, I play in 240p mode. But it's really, I mean, we're talking a long library of games or a long list of games that uh, that are 480p that work perfectly. So, you know, just decide if it's worth it to you. But I actually wasn't 100% sure on that 480p thing myself. So I was glad that Christoph uh, was able to verify that for me. Zabernaki asked, what's on your holiday wish list this year? Uh, I'm trying to get my own list together and could use some ideas. Um, man, that's a that's actually a really tough question. Uh, there's a lot of stuff coming out next year that I would love to have now, um, some of which I do. <laughs> still, still in beta testing. Uh, you know, I always say the Dreamcast uh, HD retrovision cables. As much as I like to tease my friends, I, I think with everything going on in the world, these last run of, or round of delays weren't really their fault. But um, that's something I would like to see just because of ease of use. I think that's going to help a lot of people out with a bunch of specific scenarios. Um, you know, if I didn't already have an OLED TV, I have a 2016 model, I would absolutely want to get one of the new the new ones that I just reviewed a few weeks ago. Um, that's absolutely would be number one on my list. Uh, I'm not as crazy about it uh, or like obsessed with getting it, I guess is a better way to say it, just because my 2016 OLED still looks absolutely amazing. And while it, you know, there, there's some complaints, it's laggy, um, it's not compatible with 5X mode OSSC, but I usually game on CRTs, so that doesn't bother me. Um, and if you have a solid blue screen, there's like a line going down the middle. It's almost like they took two OLED panels and stitched them together to make one 65 inch and you could see the seam or something, but it's, it's rarely visible. And, uh, other than that though, there's really no other complaints about my TV. I mean, I absolutely love it. Modern with modern gaming, having two frames of lag isn't a big deal. I game retro on CRTs, but if I didn't own that TV, I would, I would be, you know, flipping out right now trying to figure out a way to get that brand new LG OLED just because it, it looks better than mine. You know, not light years better, but definitely better. Uh, the BFI mode looks really cool. It, you know, the low lag is awesome. So other than stuff that's either, you know, that's probably not going to make it 
out by holiday season this year, I would say that's probably the number one is it would be that LG OLED TV. But that's always a tough one because, you know, while I, I love working with developers, I always see what's coming six months, a year, a year and a half from now. And those are the stuff I'm excited about because that's what I'm kind of working on. So uh, it's always hard to answer, especially to be fair to everybody because, I, you know, I, I always want to hype up products that I truly believe in, but I want to do so in a way where I'm not saying, I know something you don't know, like, you know, so... Uh, I guess the short answer to your question is, if I didn't own an OLED already, my holiday wish list would absolutely be that OLED TV I reviewed in any size. And um, I'm, there's also a lot of stuff coming out next year that if I knew it was going to be out within the next month, one of those would probably be on the top of the list instead. Joseph Vessel said they got the Analog NT Mini Noir. And with the jailbreak firmware comes a copy nest ability to dump your carts so they could be played via the SD card. They've been very much looking forward to this as they want to dump their copy of Battle Kid. Uh, and they want to do this because the non-beveled PCBs that, the, uh, that Columbus Circle uses for the carts, uh, as well as the improper voltage. I've tried most of the dumping options on copy nest and can't get it to work with this cartridge. How do I get a solid dump of my cart? Uh, that is an excellent question that I have zero answer to. Um, I don't have an NT Mini at all, uh, the old or the new one. I definitely don't plan on purchasing one, uh, but that is probably one of the best features of, of these is the ability to dump your own carts. Uh, there's also other cartridge dumpers out there that you could plug directly into a PC that work fine. Um, but I would try to I would try to find a forum or a Discord server that uh, that really centers around cart dumping and stuff like that, uh, maybe Nestev or something, and see if anybody else ran into the same issue. Because I know a lot of people that they want to dump their own carts and their own save game files. And depending on the game, that might make a lot of sense. To, you know, it might be just OCD, but I'm totally supportive of that. So. I think if something doesn't dump properly, it's you know, it's worth a discussion at least because maybe that one cart is just weird, or maybe there's a bug in the copy nest that Kevin could update in a future firmware update or something. No clue, but uh, I'm definitely not the expert for that one. My apologies. Looks like Oliver Claire had a few questions, so I'll start with the first one. They're looking into getting a couple of shielded RGB SCART cables from Retro Access and was measuring out the room so that they could keep the cables to the minimum length possible. I had heard that there could be signal loss or degradation when the cables are longer than 8 feet. Is there any truth to this, and what would be your recommended upper limit regarding cable length, both for RGB SCART and other signals such as component or composite? So just to be specific and clear on this, um, the longer the cable, the more the signal degradation. So if you are on an oscilloscope or if you have a perfect capture that you zoom in a thousand times, you could start to see the difference from one inch to six inches to a foot to three feet. Now, on an actual TV, even going into an OSSC with optimal timings on a 75 inch OLED on an actual TV, you're not going to start to see any of that signal degradation for a while, only when you're doing analysis. So I want to make sure I'm clear about that. Even if you're playing on a perfect giant TV with everything as good as it gets, you're not going to be able to see the difference between a one inch cable, a one foot cable or a three foot cable. It just, it's not, it's not something that translates to that level of detail. However, the normal length of a cable is like five feet ish. Uh, you know, I think the HD retrovisions are about that. So, uh, meaning even just the RCA to RCA ones. So, I would really kind of go for around that. I remember Stee saying that um, he had linked together two sets of cables uh, or two sets of extension cables. So just the HD Retrovision RCAs into one extension cable into another extension cable and couldn't see, couldn't really see enough signal degradation for it to matter at all. Uh, only, like I said before, when actually doing signal analysis of it. Um, now, the better the cable, of course, you know, the more that stands. A cheap cable is going to look like garbage if it's three inches long because it's not shielded and all that stuff. So my recommendation is always make the cable as short as realistically possible. Um, and anytime you're going from analog to digital, have the analog cables be the short cables and then run as long of a digital cable as possible. So, for example, if you have all of your consoles, you know, in one of those like short and wide IKEA shelves, 
and you're going to a projector that's behind you, uh, you know, via like an open source scan converter, have all of those cables go to a SCART switch into the OSSC and then get one really long HDMI cable. Even those, uh, the HDMI over optical ones I've seen, I think I've tested at least one of them, and they go for like 500 feet with zero signal loss whatsoever. Um, you know, uh, go that route if you would. Um, so to answer your question directly, you know, keep it as short as possible. If there's any digital, uh, if the end point is digital, make that the longer cable. Um, and same thing, if you have a long run of analog cables, keep consoles to switch as short as possible. And then from switch to the monitor, if that needs to be the long one, um, maybe look into just using uh, a couple of HD retrovision cables linked together. Once again, just the the basic RCA, either plug to receptacle or plug to plug ones, and let you know. Just use some converters if you're going to SCART or something like that. But um, as far as getting a custom one from Retro Access, if you needed like a 15 foot coax SCART cable, I'm sure they would do it. But that's going to be expensive, and 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 rightfully so. You know, that's <laughs> that's a lot of cable in there. That's uh, so. Yeah, you're going to have to just kind of oversee your entire setup and figure out from there what's going to be the best move for you. Moving on, another one from Oliver Clare. They took a long break from console gaming right around the time that online multiplayer was just in its infancy. And since getting back into gaming, they've rarely used online multiplayer and never used voice chat services. Now they're really interested in trying to get some of their older hardware online. My understanding is that for players who still want to have online multiplayer sessions using their original hardware, such as the PS2, the go-to third-party solution is software like Xlink, Kai, and Discord and Skype for voice chat. The question is, are there any consoles from the seventh generation or older where the console's original proprietary multiplayer voice or chat service is still online in 2020 and is still more widely used than the third-party software workarounds? Um... So I don't know for sure. I'm, I'm by no means an expert in any of that. But I do think that the go-to, as you said, are the third-party services run by the community. And I believe that's even the same for PC gaming. So it's kind of my... It's kind of my recommendation for people that if they have a PS4 or 5 or an Xbox series or one... I hate those names. The last two Xboxes, the brand new one and the one after it, just use their own multiplayer service and kind of go from there. And anything before that, do a bit of research and see. And it might even be different per game. So maybe, you know, maybe for original Xbox, there's the main service that everybody uses. But if you're only playing one specific game, you should log into this server and go to that session. But uh, I'm definitely not an expert at that, but I would certainly take the time to, if you are, if you were looking for a specific uh, like experience or game, I would research that one and kind of base your decision on that. Colin Kenny had a question about the Ashenworks RGB to YC converter box. Uh, I talked about that the past few weeks, and uh, I'm not going to read through the question. I'm just going to skip to the answer because there are so many acronyms here. I just, I want to make it I want to take something that's going to be confusing and try to make it as least confusing as possible. Uh, but it looks like Colin's got to set up with a G-SCART switch and a G-COMP switch, presumably going to a flat panel TV through a scaler or something like that, and also wants to have light gun use on, I would assume, a nice consumer-grade TV that you probably picked up with S-Video inputs to it. Uh, so... Um, there, you're going to have one bump in the road here that you'll need to figure out, but I'll just go through real quick anyway. So uh, there's a bunch of inputs on this device that are simply designed to say, hey, we're going to have inputs for every scenario you can imagine, just so you don't have to worry about connector conversion, uh, as long as the signal is the same. So it has standard RGBS SCART input, which, um, you know, from your G-SCART switch, this is what you would be connecting to. Uh, it also has the JP21 version RGBS input for anybody that has those devices. It's got a D-sub VGA style input that would uh, con that would accept either RGBS or RGBHV, but still a 15 kilohertz, you know, not 480p signal. Um, and then lastly, it has RCA inputs for red, green, blue, and sync. And these could also accept sync on green, so you could just use these three, sorry. Uh, but the purpose of those are not 
you know, you can only use one input at a time, and the purpose is just connectors, nothing else. So if you had like an Extron Crosspoint setup, you could just grab some BNC to RCA solution and use that. If for whatever reason your setup ends up in a BNC or um, a D sub VGA connector, you could use that. And for your setup, once again, you would use just a regular SCART input on the end. So that's all that is. It's one input at a time only, and it's essentially just so you don't have to mess around with adapters to get, you know, SCART to something else or whatever. Uh, now, that, as I showed in the video, should work fine with all of the RGB SCART cables. Uh, light gun should work, no problem. However, it also should work for component video when talking about things like PS2 or original Xbox in 480i mode. Once again, this will not convert 480p to 480i. This just converts those signals to S-video, and uh, S-video and composite do not accept 480p. But for example, if you had a PS2 light gun game, that should work fine. I have not tested that, but it should work the same as when I showed off the RGB to S-video conversion. The only thing that I'm unsure of, I think would work, but if you had, let's just say, a Sega Genesis with HD retrovision cables going into your G comp switch into this, into your S video TV, that's the only thing I'm unsure of. It still should work, but that's doing two conversions. Uh, but it doesn't sound like that's your setup at all. It just sounds like PS2, original Xbox, you know, on, on the component side, and it's just one conversion, and that should still work perfect. So hopefully I answered the question properly. And uh, also, thank you very much for all your kind words. Uh, and I agree, you, you suggested with those Sega 3D glasses and light gun picture, it's a prime merch opportunity. <laughs> Bob the t-shirt, Bob the action figure, just picture that in space balls. I, I would love that. That would be hilarious. I'd have to figure that out, though. <laughs> Doomleg just wanted to follow up on the question from last week regarding going through the Unigen converter that allows you to use a Sega Genesis controller on a PC engine. Um, I guess Doomleg was having issues with that, reached out to Sega Sonic fan who makes these, and realized that you just have to put the joys in three-button mode in order for it to work through that adapter, not six-button mode. Uh, so thank you for following up. I just I would have never guessed that, even though it seems like a pretty obvious thing now that you say it. It just it didn't even register in my brain. So I appreciate you saying that. And hopefully now that I've said the words out loud in a QA, and a I'll remember it. Probably not, though. A <laughs> couple of questions from Jason Guffey. Um, I've tried to answer your question, your second question, a few times now, but I always end up going off on a rant because it's a, it's a touchy subject with me because I've been involved in some things like that over the years, mostly indirectly, like just with companies that I've worked for, but it, it really strikes a nerve with me and I tend to get all angry and rambly. So I feel like it's better if I just take a step back and answer more generally and calmly. Uh, but once again, not, I'm not like upset with you or anything. I'm upset with the situation, but to go through your questions, a few weeks ago, I pointed out that the Sega Genesis collection on Steam is a cheap, easy, legal way to get authentic ROMs. Uh, just wondering if there are other similar collections. No, not that I know of. There, there probably is. I just hadn't heard about them. And it's something that really, really pisses me off because the video game industry should have figured this out by now. Um, the music industry is at least trying. Artists are still getting kind of screwed, but at least at least when you're trying to purchase music now, whether you technically rent it when your services like Spotify or buy it through Google or iTunes, at least consumers now can do that and not worry about, is this legal? Is this not legal? And it's something that video game companies should have figured out. And it's, it's really crappy that they haven't. Your next question uh, is about that smash tournament that got shut down which was shut down for sp supposedly a specific plugin that enabled online play. Uh, Nintendo sent them a cease and desist and they just complied. Uh, so Jason's question was if they would do that, you know, what's next? Who are they coming after next? And here's a question. Here's really what tripped me up and I'm not going to go on a rant about this. Uh, what I think happened is I think there was something else involved there and Nintendo just didn't explain it or the Smash tournament didn't clarify or something. But my 100% guess, total speculation, is that Nintendo found that that plugin used intellectual property from, let's just say, making stuff up, but let's just say from one of the leaks. And if they let this go on, 
they would then have to let other tournaments and other stuff go on that used the leak. So this might have been their way of saying, like, you're not using our stolen code in anything anywhere, and we're going to come after people that do. Now, I'm making all of that up. That is a guess. That's just something that makes sense in my head. But the thing that gets me really upset, not only just the, the music thing that we talked about, but the thing that gets me upset about this is in my experience through other companies I've worked with, and not usually me directly, is that any company with a budget will always win. So maybe that Smash tournament did everything 100% by the book. And even maybe they did something 100% by Twitch's rules, but that still doesn't quite comply with US law, which is, uh, you know, a tricky subject in itself. So, but maybe Nintendo just, maybe somebody on their legal team didn't like the person running the tournament, so they sent a cease and desist. Who knows? And that's what gets me really upset. And I think if I were to answer that in the way that I want to answer that, I would want to do that with a lawyer and, and make it like a full video talking about how how fair use, uh, fair use rules of a company are not protection of a law of a country. They're two totally different things. And it sucks, by the way. I'm not saying that's the right thing to do. I'm just kind of upset about the reality of things versus what people say is true or not. So that's my only point in that. To answer your question, who are they coming after next? It's my guess, once again, that there was a specific reason for them coming after them. So who would they come after next is somebody that they feel threatens their current income. Not their past income, not gray area rules, not 100% legal that they're just mad at. My guess is that whoever, who they come after next is people that threaten their current, uh, their current income. So I'm going to end it there. Otherwise, I'm going to go off on another long rant. <coughs> Excuse me. And last, um, uh, you use a humidifier, but know that humidity and electronics don't mix. Um, however, too much aridity could also lead to brownouts. So there's got to be some kind of Goldilocks zone for uh, too dry or you know or too humid. Is this something worth considering, or is it not worth the risk to spend thousands of dollars on equipment and uh, you know and to protect your equipment and stuff like that? So it's always tricky for me. Um, like I, I sleep with a humidifier, uh, in the winter because, you know, anybody who's ever been in apartment buildings, especially New York apartment buildings in the winter, know what it's like, you know, it's, it's bone dry, it's, you know, blistering hot. So, but I also only have like, you know, a, a laptop in that room, you know, maybe some stuff like in storage boxes. And I'm aware of the fact that it's probably not the greatest thing for it, but I, I just, I, I kind of don't. I, I don't really have a choice. So while I I would love to have a room that's sealed, like a couple of computer rooms I'd worked in over the years, that it's always at the perfect humidity and always at the perfect temperature, um, I think you really just got to stay away from the extremes. I think that's probably the best way to do it. <clears throat> so don't have your electronics right next to that heater that's bone dry and, you know, that's probably not going to be the best thing for it. And don't have your electronics right next to that humidifier so that, you know, the, the mist is landing right on a piece of electronics. But, you know, it's always a balance of like lifestyle versus how much money you want to spend on protecting something. And the longevity of stuff, you know, could vary greatly depending on many other things. So I would just try to not, not do anything too extreme on either side. And, uh, you know, and just pay attention to any, any simple things like, is your humidifier next to your monitor? Is it easy to just put your monitor on the other side of the room than the room that the humidifier is in, you know, basic stuff like that. So it's probably something that uh, would be a, a good larger discussion to have about protecting your equipment. But I think that that's, uh, that's probably the, the best way to put it at the moment. And uh, thanks very much for your, your nice comments at the end. And also, once again, you know, I'm not, your, your questions were awesome. Uh, it was just, I get really upset about certain things and I get really pissed about things that, you know, if you follow the rules and still get in trouble. So I, I guess uh, one day I'll do a, a video with a lawyer talking about all this stuff. And I'll probably end up yelling at the lawyer the whole time, even though the lawyer is not the one that, <laughs> not the problem at all. I just, you know, I'll take it out on them and not uh, not the, your question and not these Q&As. <laughs> 
Sean Richmond wanted to follow up about the conversation that we had a few weeks ago about the FX Pack Pro Sean was using having issues, and it looks like switching to a different firmware and turning off in-game hooks fixed the problem. So that's pretty cool. However, somebody else had a similar issue that had similar symptoms, and it turned out it was their PPU. So uh, I guess Sean's question were, are there any signs of PPU failure you should look out for? And I guess, how would you determine something like this without having other consoles to, uh, to test? Um, that's a really good question. If you have, I, I would guess if you have issues on games with uh, ROM carts and original carts and everything's clean and working, uh, that's how I would start to troubleshoot it. But after some point, I would assume that you would start to, you would need to start swapping parts between different consoles to really figure this out. Um, some of my modern friends have talked about this issue before, and I think there's just uh, certain signs, like certain graphical glitches that are signs of one thing versus another. But I think if you don't have other stuff to test on, and I think if you, uh, you know, if you don't have equipment to test, the best thing to do would be exactly what you did and just ask questions in places where other people have run into this and see if you could find other people that have had the closest problem to yours and see what they did to fix it. And unfortunately, if it's, you know, a dead PPU, then you might want to, uh, you might want to just pick up another console. If you're a modder, you could pick up a broken, you know, a blown out board or something and start swapping chips around. But, you know, at that point, I, I would probably, unless it's something super sentimental or something you already invested a lot of money in modding, I would probably just pick up a different console. Uh, and Sean also said, um, I know you have mentioned enjoying great beers. So as a Kentucky resident, I want to recommend Weller Antique 107 Bourbon. It's hard to find, but definitely worth it at MSRP. Thank you. I will add that to my list. I actually, every time I get recommendations, I message AJ, the guitarist from Answer Infinity. And, uh, you know, we, I, I message, or actually I email. And that way, every time I head over there, I just search for his email address and then look it up all the recommendations and uh, hit up the liquor store and see if I could find any of the stuff that people recommend. And then we usually try them out together because we're both into different types of booze and stuff. So uh, I just want to let you know that all of your suggestions are are taken seriously and if it's something i think i would even remotely like it's not you know a million bucks i would definitely pick it up and try it um my favorite is still legion uh it's that it's like a cross between japanese and or irish whiskey i've really been liking that one um but i'm, I'm definitely going to try your recommendation too cam says what's the best way to set up a single analog dac for use with two analog consoles Ideally, the setup wouldn't require me to change any cables, would be automatic, would be lagless, and would integrate seamlessly into my current setup, which is consoles to GSCART switch with one output going to a BVM and the other output going to a flat screen via the OSSC. Uh, so I don't think you could accomplish all of that, but I'll, I'll get you close. Um, I have a video that I already released on this. Um, it doesn't go over your exact scenario, but I would highly recommend watching that. I'll link to it below. Um, but here's the issue. In order for the DAC to work properly, it needs to see the analog console the instant it powers on. Not, you know, not a second later, like within milliseconds of powering on, because the analog console will plug or like uh, pulls the HDMI port to get its EDID value to say, hey, this TV is only 480p compatible. This TV is only 720p compatible. And when it reads the DAC, it says, oh, there's a DAC plugged in. Let's switch to that mode. So step one would be you would have to always have that connected. Now, you could definitely do this with a manual switch because a manual 2 to 1 HDMI switch, when you select the input, it's essentially the same as if you had unplugged and replugged directly in. Um, I believe some people in the comments of that video linked to uh, multi port manual switches. The only one I've tested and found was a 2 to 1 uh, bi directional, too, as well, if, if you needed that. So, um, in order to do this, you would have to first select the input. Now maybe there's a matrix switch that you could do this yourself with, uh, but that would have to be step one. The other problem is I don't know how the OSSE would interpret the signal from the DAC. I can't, I know somebody's tried before and I can't remember what it did. So that would have to be another way that you would have to deal with it. I don't think you could solve that automatically at all. There's a chance that you could get 
uh, let's say an HDMI matrix switch where you plug both analog consoles into it, or you know, probably more for any that come in the future. And then you would be able to select which outputs, and that would allow you to say, okay, I want to do the Mega SG into my flat panel, so directly skipping everything else. So I manually set the matrix switch to you know Mega SG input, flat panel output and then turn it on and that would probably work. And then if you wanted to go through the DAC to your BVM, you would set that same thing. Like I'll set it to Super NT and set it to DAC and then power it on. And assuming that the switch is compatible, it would be able to do the handshake that way. So that's one way to do it, but I don't, I've never tested that. You would have to find a matrix switch that could be handled that way. Um, some of the automatic switches or even powered switches that weren't automatic freaked out and weren't able to do that. So, you know, it's going to be that exact setup is going to be tricky. So I would kind of step back and see what you really need in all of this. I would, uh, because they're so cheap, I would absolutely buy that two to one switch that I linked to in the video and just try it. So that way it wouldn't be fully automatic, but you'd have to just press one button to switch between the two consoles. And if, if that works through the OSSC, then it's good enough, right? It's automatic uh, for everything except switching between which analog console you want to power on. Um, if it doesn't work through the OSSC, you would have to find through uh, the matrix switch scenario that I just talked about. And depending on your settings and depending how it looks on your flat panel, you, you might want to go direct anyway. I don't really know. You're going to have to experiment with that setup. So, uh, you know, I think I can get you close, but you're going to have to probably just watch the video I did and then do some experimenting on your own. Kurt Bunker says, our family studio is looking for console artists, especially ones that could take five plus retro consoles to paint for a giveaway on Small Business Saturday. We have a few locally here in Alaska, but with the pandemic, it's clear I need to ship out nationally or internationally to get these completed by early to mid-January at the latest. Looking to paralyze as we have quite a few batches, I'm looking for a few to have experienced uh, full unit work like airbrush, wrap, etc. I'm also looking for aspiring or new artists to support to take a shot at learning a new skill. I... Uh, Plenty of retro code super units. I have plenty of retro code super units to send for a practice unit or two before the modded consoles. Any thoughts or ideas are appreciated. Uh, I should have reached out sooner as your Q&A is very helpful to us. Oh, thank you. Um, so I don't know of anybody personally that does that. However, I've seen over the years really beautifully painted consoles. And I especially like to see the before and the afters where somebody took just a gross yellowed console, you know, a failed retro bright attempt, something like that, and, and turned it into a piece of art. So basically taking something that was either unfixable or, or pretty bad and really made it worth uh, doing all of that work to it. So it wasn't like a mint condition console that got painted. Um, it was, you know, something that could have used some love like that. So I think the best thing to do is uh, if people would comment on this video, that way everybody could see it, not just subscribers, uh, but anybody that knows of a good artist, um, please post below. If, if they have like a Twitter account, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of links get caught in sp uh, spam filters. I try to filter everyone properly, but I don't always get to all of them. So if somebody has a Twitter account, you know, like for if you were talking about me, I would I would comment like, hey, check out Bob. He's at, you know, the AT, not the at sign, retro RGB on Twitter. And that way that wouldn't get uh, caught in any filters. Once again, I, I really do try to every single day go in and, and check ones that are, but there's just so many bots on YouTube now that if I don't put that filter, you would just have every comment and every video would just be links to like, do you want to make $5,000 in two days? Like crap like that. So uh, that's definitely uh, what I hope. If anybody knows any artists or if you are an artist, please post uh, your information. If you only have website links, I will try my hardest to make sure they all get through and approved in the comments. Um, and if, you know, if you're a friend of mine that does this and I just forgot that you did it, please message me and let me know and I apologize in advance. But I think that's probably the best way to go about it is just let's ask the community who they know and hopefully they would take the time to post in these comments. Well, that's it for this time. 
As always, thanks to everybody that participates in these. I really enjoy them. I also even really enjoy the hard questions, even though I sometimes don't do such a good job answering them. <laughs> but I try my best, you know, some days are better than others. But anyway, thank you all so much for your support. Uh, it just makes me happy that I get to continue doing all of this stuff and especially all the crazy development behind the scenes work that I do with people. But I love these videos too as well. So thank you all for your support and I'll see you next week.